Hello, and on the UK edition this week, we will look at Parliament. Where else? We've all seen what happened, but questions arise. What next? What we could do next? We have some pointers from the Prime Minister, from other leaders, but at the heart of the future and the course of action anyone can take would be the difference that is perceived between Islamic and Islamist, as Theresa May reminded us. The fallout of this attack will go beyond its casualty toll. It raises fundamental questions about the source of the attack. It is wrong to describe this as Islamic terrorism. It is Islamist terrorism. It is a perversion of a great faith. The attack has raised worries about a new surge in Islamophobia that leaders have tried to calm. We're not going to allow you to divide our communities. We're not going to change our way of life. Londoners aren't stupid. They know they're much more likely to be killed just in a traffic accident than by a terrorist. And we shouldn't allow the, the threat of a terrorist attack to change the way we live. I mean, literally, I mean, carry on with your life. Carry on going out, getting a meal, shopping. Don't feel you're, you've got to hide at home or at work. We will not allow a backlash of Islamophobia. Everybody will get on with their business. So it succeeded in taking some innocent lives, but it will not succeed as an act of terrorism. Sanjay Suri in London, this is Edwin Thomas for News 18. Parliament and parliamentarians will be at the heart of challenges ahead, particularly parliamentarians who represent minority areas, which makes this a good time for a word with Member of Parliament Keith Vaz. Keith, this will be a thought hanging over every MP for some time to come, no doubt. Where was I when the attack came? Where were you? I was in the chamber. We had just voted in a division on the pensions bill. We had finished the first vote. I went back to sit in my usual place and that's when they suspended the sitting. But only an hour before I presented a bill before Parliament calling for an extension of sentences for those who carried knives because last year... The same day this happened? Exactly the same day it happened. And just before that, the mother of the young man who had been stabbed to death, who came to watch the presentation of the bill, had visited me in Parliament and I had in the new palace yard where this had happened, I had taken a couple of pictures with her um, with the bill and had I taken her out of the front entrance rather than the tube entrance then I'm afraid uh, we would have been caught up right in the middle of what was happening. Uncanny timing of course but what led you to move this bill? Well a young man called Tyler Thompson had been stabbed to death by another young person uh, who was carrying knives and we wanted to increase the sentences on those who were carrying knives. Of course we didn't know that the assailant in this particular terrible uh, set of uh, events uh, was a knife carrier and had just was going to later on stab a police officer in the House of Commons. What could such legislation do? I mean, knives are commonly available and someone who's unhinged and decides to buy a knife and then use it, can the law stop this? Well, the law can stop uh, the way in which knives are sold, the age that they are sold to, and if people are caught with knives, they can put some very tough sentences uh, for those people who are caught in possession. And there is at present no legislation to stop a knife being used to kill in this manner? Oh, well. We, we can't stop someone who takes a knife and decides to use it to stab someone else, but we can make sure if that happens that uh, it is uh, the person responsible is sent to prison for a very long time. We have here someone acting apparently on his own and that seems increasingly the trend. We saw that in Nice with that truck incident and then in Paris again when a soldier was attacked some days back. Is there any way to stop this? It's very difficult when the weapons of choice are a car and a knife. Uh, we will look again and again at what happened, how this person was able to mount the pavement and drive in the way in which they did. After Nice, of course, we're always uh, aware that this kind of activity might happen, especially if you think of Parliament itself. It is very exposed. It is in the centre of London. And there will now be calls, and I support the calls for review of security, to have a look carefully at uh, what is uh, uh, being done there the number of people who enter, the number of people who get passes, all these will now be looked at very carefully.
There is a barrier outside parliament to stop a car or truck from smashing in and that clearly did its job. We had the police officer intercept this man and the police officer did his job. He was killed. Uh, tragic, horrific, of course, that attack. But the police are a line of defense. And then we had the armed policemen coming out from within the building and shooting the attacker. So the security system worked, did it not? It did work. I think the security system worked extremely well. Um, we will need to go through in great detail exactly what had happened. But the fact that they only got right into um, New Palace Yard and no further, this is where we park our cars, indicates that the system works. We were locked down, nobody came after us, but we need to look at whether or not that was the right course of action, um, bearing in mind a lot of MPs were tweeting and telling people where they were. The tragedy of this is that we, we see uh, television and movies about um, these mass attacks on uh, big institutions and organisations. Um, so if it's going to be coordinated, of course it is much, much more difficult. We don't know the full facts, we need the full facts. And I think the Metropolitan Police have been amazing in the way in which they have done their work. You've been a Member of Parliament for 30 years or so now and could you ever have imagined something like this happening in fact, you think of these policemen at Parliament as some sort of designer policemen there for tourists to take pictures with. And in fact, Officer Palmer did just that with the tourists just minutes before this attack. But even though there have been warnings of an imminent attack, did you really foresee any such thing coming? I think this has always been on the radar. There has always been the question that somebody will want to storm Parliament or Number 10 or Buckingham Palace or the London Eye, these big, big uh, institutions. The White House, the Lok Sabha, um, the Prime Minister's residence in India. The security forces, the police are always vigilant because that's where people want to go. The lifeblood of terrorism is publicity. It's the internet and publicity. And they will seek to make sure that this happens. We don't know who is behind this, what is their cause and what they hope to achieve. But of course it's given a lot of um, uh, thought to those who have wanted to do this and who may want to do it in the future. That's why we have to remain vigilant. We saw a similar attack some years back when a soldier, Lee Rigby, was killed. There does seem to be a lot of anger out there against the state, the government, its institutions, people looking for targets. Is this attack symptomatic of a larger subterranean anger out there? Well, history has a lot of examples of this, assassination, um, threats of violence, actual committals of violence have been going on in history for many, many years. There's no question of that. Um, but we always want to know why. That is the biggest question. Why would you want to do something of this kind? Why would you want to go and kill people who are going about their daily business crossing Westminster Bridge? Why would you want to then run into the Palace of Westminster and stab someone to death? Why is the biggest question that is being asked. I think the Prime Minister struck the right tone today. I think she's uh, united the country. And we need to reunite communities because if you look at a city like Leicester, we have people from every single religion living in Leicester. And all of them are united and want to be united against those who wish to undermine the values that we hold so dear. You speak of uniting communities, but every time something like this happens, Muslims have to go into defensive position, they have to distance themselves from it, we've had nothing to do with it. And there are people at the same time, on the other hand, who say that um, the community must carry some sort of collective responsibility, it must do to restrain its own, to keep an eye on its own. Is there any collective responsibility any community carries? I think we all have a responsibility. We need to go back to our constituencies and we need to be at the forefront of challenging those who preach the gospel of hate. And we're all, we cannot stand on the sidelines. You are either for them or against them. It's black and white. There is no grey. Um, uh, we need to be, all be saying these people are bad and evil and they need to be dealt with. And that's, I think, what we have to do. This again is a question that always arises. Are these acts of violence provoked, to some extent at least, by the foreign policy of Western European nations? Well, we don't know. We can't ask the person who perpetrated this attack because he is dead. But by 
the police conducting their investigation, they will be able to piece together exactly what has happened and seek to find out why he did this. We don't know. It is less than 24 hours since this happened. So, but when we do know, we want to get all the answers. This attack came just days before the whole Brexit move is triggered and a lot of the support for Brexit came out of security concerns that migrants come and they bring threats and they bring dangers with them. So could that kind of argument pick on this incident to strengthen its case and to, to really um, turn security concerns into concerns about migrants? I don't know, but next week is a big week for Britain. This is the week that the Prime Minister has to trigger Article 50 by Saturday of next week um, and otherwise she would have broken a big promise. So it's going to happen next week uh, and this couldn't have had come at a worse time with the kinds of things she has to do. On security there is the argument that the UK needs to be closely networked with the EU and its security institutions. Well, this, institutions. Is a very, this is a very important point I mean, the Prime Minister has just appointed Mark Sedwell, her permanent secretary, uh, as her new director of the Nas National Security Council. By triggering Brexit, we need to make sure that the security angle is protected, that there will be no question of our involvement in Europol, our connection through the databases and our sharing of information. This is actually even more important now following the events of the 22nd of, eight, of March. And that is a critical point for me. I know migration is put in uh, as, as a... As a key issue for others and the economy, but security is the key issue for me. But for many people, the two issues are one. They see migration and migration, particularly from certain quarters, as itself a danger to security. Right? Well, I don't know why, because there's no evidence of that being the case. I think those who come as migrants want a better life. They don't want to come here to be involved in these kinds of activities. There we are don't know. Incidents, there are, but they're very, they're very mild. We need to know why this man did this. We need to know what drove him to behave in this way. And when we get the full facts, we need to deal with them. This is an attack on the people and institutions of Britain. Well, it's a, it is certainly the way in which it was conducted looks like an attack on the symbol of democracy. Um, this is not your local branch of Tesco's. It's the mother of all parliaments. So there's a reason why this happened. There's a reason why this guy drove on Westminster Bridge and then ran into the palace. It looked as if he knew what he was doing. We need the full facts and then we need to make sure that we follow from those facts any advice that could be of help. Finally, what, as Member of Parliament, do you take from this as a way of dealing with constituents? Well, it is very difficult. Uh, I've done this for 30 years and with the murder of Joe Cox last year, a dear and valued colleague, there is a fear that there may be an attack on you and, and, and your staff more than you because they work with you. So it is a worry and we will be vigilant. We have cameras and things of that kind. But of course if someone is determined to do something, they will do it. There is a threat to every leader, no doubt, but there is a threat also to communities from within. What as MP could you do by way of networking with constituents, communicating with them to try and calm this anger, to try and preempt any such expression of anger? I think the key thing is engaging with communities. One of the problems with our counter-terrorism strategy, which is called PREVENT, um, it's not really um, valued by the communities. And we need to engage more, such as the work that has been done by my Chief Constable in Leicester, Simon Cole. Um, engaging with communities is extremely important and we need to continue to do that. Grim days, but thanks very much, Keith, for talking to us at News 18. Thank you very much, Sanjay. Time for a quick break, but we stay around Parliament to look at the political challenge coming up next, that of Brexit. See you in a bit. for the Brexit divorce kicks off next week and a word on that now with Professor Lord Desai. Lord Desai, thank you very much for joining us here on the UK edition. Theresa May will pull the trigger on Article 50 this week. 
could that start Britain on a winning streak or could Britain end up shooting itself in the foot? No, I think, you know, one has to be confident that regardless of all the propaganda going on on both sides, people will negotiate sensibly. It's going to be a complicated negotiation. It is not a simple shootout. And I think it will have to take two years because there are so many things to uh, get through. They will first decide on the financial obligations. Once they do that, then they can work on the uh, arrangements after Brexit. The financial arrangements won't be easy. We have indications from the EU that the UK will never have a deal that's better than what it has at present or even the equivalent of that. And the EU can't afford that. The UK should. No, no. See, so UK right now is one of the uh, countries, one of the few countries which pays more than it gets out of. You know, it's a lot of progressive taxation. But that only directly. No, no. What, what UK pays, and even after the rebate, and even after what it gets back, there is still a bit of surplus UK puts in. You know, uh, now, obviously, when the UK goes, the EU budget will suffer. So they have to do something about making the e UK fulfill its obligation for this budget cycle, which goes on till end of 2020. So we have 21 months of not being a member, but we have signed up to the budget. So there'll be some portion of that. And then we don't know whether there will be a pension uh, obligation as well. Uh, I am on a committee in the House of Lords, which we have written a report on this. And it's, it's a moving feast. It could be anywhere between 10 billion to 80 billion. So there will be a lot of negotiations on that. We had the referendum, of course, and we know the result of that. But when that matter came to the House of Commons, there was an even more overwhelming support for Brexit. What was behind that? Well, you know, MPs who were themselves Remainers, but whose constituency voted against. You see, in England, except for London, all the regions voted against. So the MPs did not want to go against the wishes of their constituents, especially in the Labour Party side. And so I think the MPs decided to follow what the people had said, rather than just decide on their own. And the Lords, what have the Lords done to that debate, to that bill? Well, we tried to amend it. We, we said two amendments. First of all, we said that we must guarantee the security of the people from the EU who are working in uh, England, who are married, who got children and so on. We must guarantee their continued residence. And secondly, we said that when the deal is done, uh, Theresa May ought to come back to Parliament and explain to Parliament what the deal is before it is shown to European Parliament. Now, it just so happens that the Commons rejected both those amendments. But I think it is now understood that those things will have to be fulfilled sooner or later. We hear a lot, of course, from the UK on Brexit, from the leaders in the media. We don't hear quite as much from the EU side, and what we do hear does not sound very conciliatory. What does that suggest? No, I think to begin with, there's going to be a lot of posturing. You know, it doesn't pay either side to look soft. So they'll both go in with all fists flying. But once they sit down, there'll be a lot of room for compromise. The EU has to coordinate 27 member countries' response. So they have, they're waiting for the formal submission of our uh, Article 50 uh, invoking. And then they have to put together their strategy. It'll take them at least a month, if a month and a half. And in the middle, there are the French elections and then the German elections. So they have to be very careful because the people who might end up negotiating are not the people who are currently in office. So they also have problems. We only have a single team. They have 27 teams. And what might the fallout be on the EU side? Will it draw tighter together or could there be some unraveling, maybe even eventually disintegration? No, I think, you know, what the EU will learn is that they need a multi-speed Europe, as it is called. 
You can't integrate everybody. You know, Eastern European countries are very unhappy about migration within. They're very unhappy about the Euro. They haven't joined the Euro, Poland and Hungary and Czechoslovakia. So I think what will happen is they will have to learn a slightly looser arrangement and each person do what they like within a certain limit of, say, being in a being under the European Commission directives and so on. There has been some talk of late of no deal as almost a sort of deal in itself. What could that mean? No, I think you know, no deal is an extreme statement because if at the end of two years there had been a very much uh, sort of bad tempered quarrelling and so on and the best that the EU can offer is not good enough for us, we can in theory walk out. But nobody knows what a no deal means because we have a variety of arrangements, including, for example, civil aviation. The right of British Airways airplanes to fly and land on EU airports is part of an agreement. Like if you don't have an agreement, they'll have to stop flying. So we can't, I think no deal is not realistic. It is just a gambit. Is it at all likely that trade with India or with other Commonwealth countries, and we heard a good deal about increased uh, such trade, do you think this kind of trade could ever replace, even to a small extent, the trade with the EU? No, not really. But over the next 10 years or so, what the what, uh, UK has to look for are regions of the world which are prospering. India is obviously one of them. China is another. Asia, by and large, is a prospering region. And if they can get good free trade agreements with China and India and Indonesia and so on, they may be able to compensate slightly. But yeah, Europe is so much nearer and Europe is so much richer. You know, Europe is the easier option. Now, if you're going to give up an easier option, we have to work harder. It is said now that a UK-India free trade deal is very much more likely minus the EU. But the UK is, of course, a much smaller market. Uh, what could the contours of such a deal look like? India is in a very powerful position now vis-à-vis -vis the UK. And India can really insist on what it wants with respect to uh, student visas and skilled labor visas. And in return for that, they can have access to the legal services market uh, with what the UK wants. But I think India is in a very strong position. Well, Theresa May went to India and said no to all that. Not very tactful, was that? Well, she learned, you know, ultimately she learned. You're an optimist. I'm an optimist. I'm an optimist. Well, last word on the Indian community in Britain, which voted overwhelmingly, it seems, for Brexit. Um, did they have some foresight in that direction along with the others who voted for it or were there any particular reasons for Indians voting for Brexit? I think that basically it, that is a good sign that Indians feel very much like the British. They don't feel somewhat peculiar and they basically took the view like a lot of other British have taken that they don't want the Romanians and Bulgarians crowding in. I mean, it is, it is not, it is, you know, it's not very good but anyway they identified more with their fellow white British citizens than with anybody else. And that, that means they have acculturated and feel at home. Well, that might be a good thing in some ways, even if it may not necessarily lead to the best outcome, but we'll have to wait and see. Meanwhile, we remain optimistic like you. Thank you very much, Lord Desai, for talking to us. Thank you.